seated. Woo! There we go. We're on. Yes, we're going to receive this morning's tithing offering. I've got a couple of announcements for you. And, uh, and one of the, the big things is um, we have a hub work day. So August 7th from 9 a.m. until noon. And if you can stay longer, we, we greatly appreciate it. But we don't, wanna, we don't want to, uh, you know, eat up everybody's Saturday. And that's going to be August 7th, Saturday, August 7th from 9 to noon. We're going to do painting and deep cleaning. And we, we do have to, uh, we got a couple sp- touch-up spots and some things that we need to take care of. So just asking if, you, if you've got a paint pole or a drop cloth, those are, those are needed. The rest of it will be supplied by the church. So we just need a lot of bodies, make a lot of light work. Amen? So it's open to us. We'll talk about that here in a few minutes. But we, we're having a hub work day, okay? So from 9 to noon, August 7th, just a couple of hours, we're going to paint and we're going to deep clean. Um, and then if you are volunteering to be a part of the ministry at the Hub, it's two hours Monday through Thursday from 4 to 6 p.m. And if you're volunteering, we need you to go down and talk to or email or private message p.m. Pastor Kathy, okay, so she can get that process started for you. All of our, all of our volunteers are background checked. And just so that you know, all of our pastors are background checked, which means I had to pass a background check. If I can pass a background check in the name of Jesus, right? And they, no one held my, all of my wayward tickets against me. None of, well, there's only one in the state of Colorado, but I digress. All right, let's receive this Sunday morning's tithe and offering. Father, we come before you. We continue to declare you, Lord, over our finances. We ask you to bless the givers as they give, as we're faithful with our tithe and offering. In your name we pray this morning. Amen. We want to dismiss student ministries. So if you're with Pastor Brittany, go ahead. I know they're having a great time down there. Um, I'm told, parents, that there is a... That's an apple for me for later. But I'm told, parents, that there is a, an Olympic-themed kids service this morning. And so uh, I'm looking forward to that. And Pastor Steve, or actually, if somebody could bring me the notes. Because, <laughs> and all the fun we've had this morning. Yeah, seriously, I need notes. <laughs> Turn in your Bible to Revelation, to chapter, thank you, there we go. All right, I'm good, I've been prepped. We're prepped, I'm way prepped, okay? But this morning has been so much fun. There's been so many things that have been going on, and I'll, I'll talk about it in just a second. I actually forgot the notes. Now we're good. We're all on the same page. I hold in my hand. Are you ready? Thank you for praying and fasting with us this last week. We desperately needed it. Here's the contract for the hub. Praise the Lord. Yes. So we have that process that we're going to continue to to get through. But your prayers got answered. Thank you for for partnering uh, with Kate and I as we prayed and fasted for for the hub. Uh, for for what's next for church. We're not done yet. We're still fasting and praying um, as to what's next for the church. In case you haven't noticed, there's a big giant for sale sign right outside that wall right there. And uh, yeah, I was at a pastor's meeting this week and they said, what is one unique thing about your church? And I said, we have been unceremoniously dismissed three times now. And everybody went, oh, really? And the like, well, wait, we're not that kind of church. It's not, it's, not, it's not that bad. It's just, here we are. And we're in Clifton, and God's placed us in Clifton. And, and I want you to know that our heart is for the city of Clifton and to go after and fight for people who nobody's fighting for, right? That's, that's what the church is about. And I, I, listen to me. Maybe you came from a different church. We're glad you're here. But the body of Christ is bigger than sheep swapping. All right? We... Sheep swapping is fine, but listen, let me tell you something. There are people out here in our community who do not know the Lord, or they've walked away from God, okay? And that's our heart, and that's our mission. That's why we start, are, are starting the hub. 
to go after families, okay, specifically to provide a safe place for our elementary kids, but to go after families who need to know the love of Christ. Amen? All right. Revelation chapter 12. If you have a good NIV study Bible, okay, it says the woman and the dragon. Okay? Hence our title screen this morning. Let me read this to you, and then we'll unpack it. John sees a great and wondrous sign appearing in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads yeah, with se- excuse me, with seven heads and ten hordes and seven crowns on his head. And his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. Verse 6. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who led the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of His Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they did not love their lives so much as to shrink back from death. Therefore rejoice you heavens and you who dwell with them but woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he'd been hurled down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. Verse 15. Then from, this, from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening, opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. How many of you are like, yeah, I have no idea what just happened. Okay, let's, let's talk about this. We're in the book of Revelation, specifically, we're in chapter 12. And in chapter 12, John sees some of the past, okay, some of the current, and into the future. Specifically, here's what's going on. The seventh trumpet is going to usher in seven bowl or vile judgments. That's your first blank. Bowl is B-O-W-L. Seven bowl or vile. You can also read it depending on what read that. It may read that way depending on your translation. Vile is not V-I-L-E. It's V-I-A-L. Seven bowl or seven vile judgments. We're not there yet, but this is what happens. Okay, doesn't happen until chapter 15. In the meantime, here's where we're, where we're beginning this period where John is seeing different things. Okay, 12 through 14 give us insight and understanding, okay, as to behind the scenes goings on since before the foundation of the earth. Okay, remember, we have a, we have a statement that Jesus makes upon the disciples coming back saying, hey, we saw, right, them, they, he was giving them authority to perform miracles, signs and wonders. Okay, this is New Testament. 
And what, he's, what the disciples come back and say, we even saw the demons obey. Remember that? They're impressed with themselves. Have you ever been impressed with yourself? Don't, don't, don't anybody raise your hand. Just, you know, keep, keep that low this morning, right? And, and Jesus makes the comment. He says, watch your pride. I saw Satan fall like lightning. Revelation chapter 12 is John getting insight into some of these things that have happened. Amen? Okay. Let's unpack this. I, I gotta, one, one by one, verse by verse. Okay? What John sees. Okay? The woman, that's your, your blank there. The woman represents Israel. Okay? Some of you that have studied Revelation before, you've heard that this could possibly refer to the church. Problem is this. The church did not give birth to Jesus, right? Jesus, by virtue of Holy Spirit, gave birth to the church at the ascension. So we can't get the cart before the ox there. Okay, so the woman here represents Israel. Is, not Mary, Israel. Okay, it, she is crowned with 12 stars representing 12 tribes. Okay? The dragon represents Satan. Now, there's going to be some things that are referenced in chapter 12 that we're not going to unpack until 13 and 14. You, you all right with that? Okay, good, because chapter 12 has enough mystery of its own. All right? The dragon represents Satan. He has seven heads crowned with seven crowns representing seven major prophetic empires that impact Israel, the Jews, and Jerusalem throughout history. Okay? You go, what are the seven empires? I'm missing my notes, so I'm going to do the best of this from my memory. And what I miss, I'll give you next week. Therefore, guaranteeing you got to come back next week for you completionists. All right? So we have the four we have the four empires, okay, that are from Daniel. Right? Which are Babylon. By the way, these are not in any particular order. Babylon, Greece, Medo Persia, which is common day Babylon and Persia are common day Iran. Iran, Iraq, that area. Okay? So Babylon, we have Medo Persia, we have Greece. Okay, we have Rome. Is that four? Number seven is an empire to be named later. We're actually going to talk about that. We'll call it Mystery Babylon if you've studied Revelation. We'll get into that a little bit later. What am I missing? Two? Give them to you next week. Look, I was just excited this morning. We got the contract for the hub. Do you, you understand? Like, I was on floating on cloud nine because we finally got that thing. God released that thing. We got everything going. And God bless our landlord who is over there fixing and sleeping. He is literally sleeping there at night in order to have everything fixed for us by the time school starts. So we bless him in the name of Jesus. One of the things about the dragon is this. He's crowned with ten horns, believed to represent ten nations ruling with him. As we get into chapter 13, we're going to see three of those nations get absorbed or, or he destroys three, however you want to call it. Okay? Daniel's vision from Daniel chapter 2, 31 through 45, there's a vision of the statue. That gives us the four prophetic empires affecting Israel and Jerusalem. Okay? Verse 43, excuse me, the, the toes of that statue are made of partly iron and partly clay. Now, 
If we hold a Western Euro- theology East or Western European interpretation of this scripture, we're thinking Rome. Okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with that. However, I want to present a different theory here. Okay? If you go back and you listen to our Daniel series from chapter 19, there is a high likelihood and very strong possibility that the Antichrist is actually Muslim. If you hold to that, okay, there are ten Arab nations and an Arab Persian, because there's difference, and an Arab Persian Islamic coalition represented by the ten toes, mixed of partly iron and partly clay, that would that would be a prophetic symbol because as history has shown us. The Muslim world cannot hold it together for very long. They do, new, they do not mix or unite well, nor do they do it very long. The Sunni and the Shiite are two major uh, sects, S-E-C-T-S, of Muslim, do not mix well. Okay, They are constantly at war with each other right now. The one thing that they would commonly unite upon and agree upon, are you ready? Is the destruction of Israel. Okay? And that they're doing that now. We have some missionary friends of ours that Kate and I have been friends with for more than twenty years. They're over there with Bridges for Israel as missionaries, and what they are reporting to you in the current conflict, okay, that's that's not being reported by the United States is that Hamas and Hezbollah are launching rockets and they are using their own people, their own Muslim people, as human shields. And what's being reported is Israel's retribution, okay, which is their their specified targets, they're hitting. What's being reported is that Israel is destroying innocent Arab and Muslim people, and that's not what's happening. What's happening is Hezbollah and Hamas are using their own people, standing behind them, launching rockets and killing them. Does this make sense? It's chaos. Listen, it's like there's an enemy at work. Are you with me? And he's sowing seeds of chaos. One of the things that we have to see happen in the last days is an anti-Semitism unlike that has been unleashed upon the world ever before. Okay? Here's the problem. How do you turn the entire world against Israel? You report, you report that they're murdering innocent children and innocents Right? And that's what we've seen happen. Now, let me pause right here for a minute because there's something in Daniel that, that I brought out during that series. And if, you, if you're wondering all about that series, it's on our website. It's in our archives, our sermon archives. It's from 2019. It's from chapter 7 through 12. Okay, that's the prophetic chapters. And then I included Psalm 83, which is a prophetic psalm of an Arab war. And Ezekiel 38, which are two wars we believe got to happen first before we get here. Okay? So go and check those out. One of the things that, that happens during this time frame is picture with me a giant puzzle. Okay? It can be as big as you want. You can have the pieces as big as you want. In order for this to, to come to fruition, and why we believe we're living in the last days and not in the millennial reign of Christ yet first off is this if this is G- if we're living in a time where Jesus is on the throne something horribly wrong has happened right this is not if we're in the millennial reign of Christ right now and again I reserve the right to be wrong if we're living in the last in the millennial reign of Christ and not the last days if we're in the millennial reign of Christ and and we're currently in a situation 
where Jesus is ruling from the throne, I want my money back. This does not feel like the king of kings as it ruled, does it? No. The second reason I believe that is because when you, when you piece together the prophetic timeline, which is where a lot of people, this makes sense and I have no problem with that, not all the pieces are together for us to be in this thousand year reign of Christ. What do I mean? Let me, let me jump ahead into next week for just a second to help illustrate my point. There are things that are predicted in, in Revelation 12, 13, and 14, and in Daniel 7 and 8, about specifically the person of the Antichrist. Not the dragon, we're talking about Satan here, okay? Specifically about the Antichrist. Not every puzzle piece is in. First John says, this is again, John speaking, his first, what we'd say, letter or epistle, First John says, many Antichrists are, excuse me, the Antichrist is here, period. Indeed, many Antichrists have already come. You with me? Okay, let's look at an Antichrist spirit through the annals of history for just a second. You had Pharaoh. Pharaoh decided that he was going to kill all of the Jewish babies two years and under. Okay? And he, listen to me, compared to the rest of world history, Pharaoh, he was a, kinder, he was a Sunday school teacher. You, you with me? We fast forward, we get to a whole lot of persecution that's happened to God's chosen people, the Jews. Okay? If you want the, the most, the one that we would know in our time would probably be Adolf Hitler. Uh, everybody gets real quiet whenever we talk about that. And, and rightly so. Approximately six million Jews were murdered during World War II during that time frame. Okay? We can go back, if you want to come back with me, go to Nero. Go to right after the fall of Jerusalem. This is about 70 AD, so from 70 to 90, which by the way, John wrote Revelation in 90 AD. We've gone through the empires mentioned in Daniel chapter 7 and 8, okay? And we get to the Roman Empire, what people believe to be the Roman Empire, ten toes, partly of clay, partly of iron, right? They don't hold together that well. They're actually, after Nero, there were ten emperors of persecution. However, two things don't sit in the timeline, remember? Remember our big giant puzzle? Israel was not a nation, Israel doesn't become a nation again until the United Nations Security Council in 1948. That, that was a huge piece of the puzzle that has stayed there. Okay? Another thing that happened is the temple's not rebuilt. Does it, you it make sense? So Nero cannot... Cause it, uh, ooh, I cannot remember. I'll have it for you next week. That I have... I have my, you should just see our, my office is our kitchen table. Thank God we have a bar where the kids eat, amen. The stack of notes between Daniel and Revelation, Kate's like, it, your, your office is thrown up all over my kitchen, right? Praise God for grace and mercy. There's, a, I got a stack of things, I'll, I'll, anything I'm muddying right now, I'll clean up for you next week. There were emperor, there were there was an uh, there were ten emperors that came in and, and, it, and immediately began persecution of the Jews. However, Israel's not a nation; the temple's not rebuilt. We go back one step further into about 141 8 BC. We get a gentleman by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes the Fourth. Okay, he did about what Hitler did. He didn't kill as many Jews, but he was up there. He actually performs what's called the abomination that causes desolation in the Jewish temple. And you go, well, why is he not the Antichrist? Israel's not a nation. You with me? 
Go back to our big giant puzzle. You remember that. You thought I forgot that illustration. Come on now. Big giant illustration puzzle. There are puzzle pieces throughout history that have been shoved in place. Give it 50, 100 years and they're pulled back out. We're into a place and a season in time or a phase in time where you are seeing more puzzle pieces go in place in the puzzle and cement there. Does this make sense? We, we recently introduced Ellie to like a 350-piece puzzle. Pray for us. Okay? One of the things that's happened with that puzzle is like when you push pieces in place, right, and they start to fit together, right, they're there. And it, it takes a little bit, like you can't just pull them out. It takes work to get those things out. Here's, here's my point. God has set puzzle pieces in place. Israel being a nation is one of them. Okay? We're going to vilify Israel because the media and the world is going to look at Israel and go, well, they're slaughtering innocent children. That, it, it's not a stretch. It's already been reported. Got it? Now, remember I said many, indeed, Many Antichrists have come. And I just walked you through. We went Nero. We went Antioch as Epiphanes. We went Hitler. We went back. We went forward. Everybody's confused. No problem. We'll clean it up next week. And we actually talk about the person of the Antichrist. Right? All I want you to know is this. Pieces are sliding in and they're staying in place. They're not coming out now. Watch who initiates... The Iran peace deal. Not the country, the person. If the Antichrist is a Muslim, don't be surprised if you see a Muslim country come to the forefront to initiate that deal. You with me? Watch who signs up for that peace agreement. You with me? You understand? These are signs. Jesus said, if you're wise, you'll recognize the end of days. You'll recognize the signs and the times. This is where we are. Praise the Lord. All this to say an Arab Persian Islamic coalition made up of Sunni and Shiite tribes would be tenuous at best. History has shown us that. If you go and you look at history in the fall of, specifically at the fall of Constantinople, there was a giant, and I'm, I'm not kidding you, when I talked about last week, who has the capacity to have a 200 million man army? If you united, if you united an Arab Persian Islamic coalition, you're there. You're, you got one. Remember, the Antichrist is given to make war and conquest. In the first three and a half years of the tribulation, he'll do that with peace. We're getting to the middle of the tribulation. John would tell you we're in the middle of the tribulation. And this vision that we're seeing in chapter 12 and 13 is the middle of the tribulation. And now he's going to, the Antichrist and Satan are going to be revealed for the, for the people and the, and the, uh, the influence that they are, okay, and declare war on Israel and the saints. You, does that make sense? Okay. Verse 4. The dragon's tail sweeps a third of the stars out of the sky. This is Satan's rebellion in heaven in which he convinced a third of the angels to follow him. Okay. The child, and that's your next blank on page 60, is Jesus. Now, John doesn't see Christ's work or t tenure in ministry here. He just says Jesus is born, does what he's supposed to do, and then ascends or is snatched up, depending on what translation of the Bible that you have, up to God in his throne. This is a snapshot, of you will, of Jesus' time on earth. So at his death, his burial, and his resurrection, much was happening behind the scenes. A war between good and evil was already underway. And when Jesus shed his blood for our sins, died, and was resurrected... Satan's defeat was assured. 
You go, how do you know that? I've got to turn my page here. Verse 12, the end of verse 12. The Bible reads, the dragon is filled with fury. Why? Because he knows that his time is short. When Satan killed Christ, he thought he won. And I love, man, I'm about to date myself. If you've ever heard, God bless his soul, Carmen, sing the song, The Champion, Satan comes to a moment of glee. Man, that as a kid, that used to give me nightmares. I'm just going to lie, not lie to you. That little, you know, that thing. Just, we'll leave it there. He, God, instead of counting out, one, two, three, counts down. Ten, nine, eight. If you've heard it, you're getting goosebumps right now right and satan is screaming no and then it breaks out into he's alive he's alive you should take a second offering if you don't want me to finish that <laughs> i'm going to finish it anyway no i'm not <laughs> i can't remember all the songs i'm old I don't know what happened. A war between good and evil is already underway. And Satan realizes he's defeated. He loses the battle. He's hurled to earth and his angels with him. He is now thrust out of cosmic realm to earth, which eventually will lead to his eternal destruct or destination and destruction in the lake of fire. We're going to get there. That's Revelation later. Most scholars believe that at this point he is no longer allowed access to the throne room of God. Why do we bring that up? Because you've got to look at Job chapter 1. In Job, and I'm going to paraphrase it for you. In Job chapter 1, we read Satan coming in with the sons of men, angels. And they are entering the throne room and Satan actually has access to the throne room. You with me? And God doesn't need any help identifying who He is. We, we could stop and I could teach another week or two just on Lucifer. The Bible records that Lucifer is an archangel and he was in charge of worship. Can I, can I preach to you for a minute? Do you know why secular music sounds so good? Because heaven's angel in charge of worship got booted out. Because he got tired of giving God all the credit. So I'll corrupt humanity. Well, some of you are like, Pastor, you ain't preaching no more, you meddling. I don't care what your radio presets are. No, I, I, I don't. <laughs> we were singing all along the watchtower this morning during worship. We, we get it, okay? Not like we didn't worship the Lord with that, okay? Just, just realize, like, yeah, music is a part of us. It's powerful, isn't it? You can go back... Let me just jump down this rabbit trail because we're already there anyway. You can go back and think about like a movie and you'll miss maybe certain lines or maybe where you were, what was going on, unless it really stood out to you. But if Journey comes on, you remember where you were, who you were with, the what day it was, what the weather was outside, and what you should or should not have been doing. <laughs> About half the room went, amen. No, no. <laughs> right? Music is powerful, and here's the reason why. The archangel that was in charge of heavenly worship decided, I'm tired of giving God all the glory. And I want some of this glory for me. Sound eerily familiar? Maybe like humanity? And he gets kicked out of heaven. Now remember, 
God doesn't need any help identifying who Lucifer is. So in Job, you read this kind of interesting dialogue that essentially Satan walks in and God has a, you know, nonchalant type of discussion and it goes, oh, well, look at you. How are you? How's it going? How, how's the earth where I banished you? Right? And, and Satan goes, you know, I'm just wandering to and fro in my little domain you've given me. Great. And, and God says, have you seen my servant Job? Did you know Satan goes, Job, let me, let me check that. And he, he doesn't compare notes. He doesn't pull out a notepad and look. You know what his response is? You have a hedge of protection around Job and I can't touch him. Satan knew exactly who he was. Because he knew that the Lord had a hedge of protection over him because Job's heart was to worship the Lord. Satan loses. Most scholars believe that at this point in time, in the, in the story of the tribulation as we approach the second coming of Christ, that Satan now has lost that ability to stand before the Lord and be the accuser of the brethren. John is now transitioning to see into something into the future a little bit. Remember, he eats the scroll of Daniel and now things in the future are opened up to him. Right? Verses 10 and 12, and I, I want to read these because I think that they're some of the most powerful. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. If you're looking at a time frame, the best place we can put this is in the middle of the tribulation. Verse 11. They, those believers, watch this, overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb. The shed blood of Jesus Christ that makes us white as snow. And by the word of their testimony... They gave testimony to the transformational work of Jesus Christ. Watch. And they did not love... We always repeat the front part of that verse when we need encouragement. Remember, these folks are in the middle of the tribulation, and that's what John is seeing. And they loved not their lives so much as to shrink from death. In other words, the transformation that had happened because of the blood of Jesus Christ was so powerful that they willingly gave their lives up and would not shrink back from the testimony of transformation because of the cross. And we're worried about whether someone would like us at work. I'm self-employed. Only work for me. <laughs> it's a thing. Listen to me. They were willing to be martyred because of what Jesus had done. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Man, that's a transformation. He says, therefore rejoice you heaven and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea. Because the devil has gone down to you and he is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. Verses 10 through 12 are praise and a declaration of overcoming for the believer. And I, I would even add to those that are martyred during the tribulation. 
the devil, knowing that his time is short, begins to st step up his plan to persecute and kill all believers. And he's going to start with the Jews. And we'll read that in verse 13. He has already tried to kill the seed in Jesus. His second step will be to persecute the woman or Israel. And his third step will be to use a flood, which many scholars describe as an anti-Semitic assault over which the world has yet to see in human history. Verse 14 reads, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. Okay? Most time frames, okay, having to do with the book of Revelation are going to call time, one year, times is two years, half a time. When we add those up, that's the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Now, I want to be honest with you. Scholars, this is where a pretty big division starts. There are those that believe the, 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 the place set aside for Israel is actually a rose city called Petra. And it's in the mountain country. And that's where God basically tucks the remnant of Israel into those end time believers or those those Israel excuse me those Jews that find the Lord during the tribulation remember there's a whole we just came out of chapter 11 in the two witnesses we have a an earthquake that caused that kills 7,000 in the city of Jerusalem destroys a tenth of the city okay and and the re, the way that chapter 11 reads is that there are those that looked upon and saw what happened and gave great fear and glory to the Lord. Now, if we believe that those are Jews that are coming to the Lord during the last half of the tribulation, okay, prophetically, they're put in this, the cleft of a rock called Petra, prepared for them. And it's in the hill country or the mountain country of Ammon. Don't worry, we'll get there. Okay? Now, again, remember I told you, scholars like, psh, there's a big, and they yell at each other, and it's just not good. Here's what I want you to know, right? The Lord protects the apple of his eye, Israel. That's all we really need to focus on. She was given great wings. In other words, she was rushed out. She was flighted away to safety. The other side of that argument is that this is what happens to the Israelites and the Jews that love the Lord in the first half of the tribulation. I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I just want to give you both sides. You can pray about it at night and tell me where I'm wrong tomorrow. Amen? Okay. Verse 15. Okay. So, or, yeah, modern day Jordan, Ammon is the old, old map. Verse 15 says, Satan spews out water like a flood, hoping to sweep Israel away in the torrent. Okay? Let me, let me just read it to you. Then from his mouth, the serpent or the dragon spewed water like a river to overtake the woman, Israel, and sweep her away with that torrent. Okay? This is what most scholars believe to be the, the most anti-Semitic persecution on the face of the planet to take place. He will spew out a river to destroy the Israelites. Okay? Remember, how do, we vilify, how do you vilify Israel after she's already been persecuted by Hitler throughout the history? Well, I would say you've got the most public persecution of the Israelites being Hitler for all the world to see. You with me? She's been persecuted, again, history lesson, since the beginning of time. Hitler, we go back, not the Antichrist. First of all, the temple's not rebuilt. And Israel's not a nation until 1948. And depending on when you believe Hitler actually died, either way, World War II is over around 44, 45. You with me? So, not the Antichrist, even though he did accomplish a lot of prophetically what the Antichrist is attributed to. 
Hitler being the most public persecution of the Jews, six million Auschwitz, we remember the Holocaust. That, all of, all of having that included in this, Hitler is going to look like a kindergarten teacher compared to what Satan is going to unleash upon the Israelites. In verse 16, the Bible says that the earth opens up and swallows up the flood that Satan unleashes. And all you need to know is that last three-letter word there in your notes is yep. There are way too many divisive things associated with that prophetic translation. People have alluded to, well, the earth opens up and it's an earthquake. Well, if you're taking that literally to be a torrent, okay, yeah. However, we're not in a literal sense. We're in a figurative sense here at this point. Okay? Do we mean it to be an onslaught? And how would the word, how would the earth open up to absorb an onslaught from the enemy like that? I have no idea. So I'm not going to try to speculate with you. Amen. Moving along, our last verse in this chapter reads like this. Then the dragon, who is Satan, was enraged at the woman, who is Israel, and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, okay, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So when he cannot totally annihilate the Jews and the Israelites by whatever manner of intervention the Lord chooses, he then decides to go after all who would believe during this time in the tribulation. Okay? As we get ready to go into chapter 13, I want to encourage you. Because you go, wow, this is heavy stuff. I want to encourage you. God has made a way. His name is Jesus. He is the hope of the world, no matter what state it's in. Some of you are thinking, man, you know what? As I look at as I look at Scripture and we look at Revelation, Pastor John, it sounds like we've been here before. You're right, we have been. You would think we would learn from history. And we we might, if it weren't written here prophetically to understand and repeat, until the Lord should come back. And I love what the Bible says. Behold, I make all things new. You're here this morning, and, and online we haven't ignored you. Pastor Steve's been back there. He's been giving you the notes and the points. And I, I want to just take a minute, and you're watching online this morning, wherever you're at. And maybe, maybe you're watching, and the rapture has taken place. And maybe what we're reading and what we're teaching this morning is at a point in time where you've somehow found this teaching or these notes. The Lord's put them in your hand. And you're, you're realizing this is where we are. And you're, you're not a believer yet, but there is, there is an unction from within inside of you that you cannot explain that says, I need to know Jesus. M- maybe you're a prodigal. And you just walked away. Maybe you're just flat out have rejected Christ and yet you find yourself at church and this is your moment and this is your opportunity another one because God is not slow as some understand slowness but he is patient and he is willing to wait for as long as, the, as many would come to him would come Maybe some of us need to hear the encouragement from 2 Samuel 
that talks about the Lord devises ways to bring home the unbeliever. Maybe you're here and maybe that's you. Maybe you're just undecided. You just go, you know what? I've heard so many different things and maybe you've had so many different experiences and maybe by choosing Christ you've always thought it's going to cost me something. It's going to cost me friends. It's going to cost me a relationship. It's going to cost me, and I just don't know that I want to pay that price. I want to tell you something right now. Whatever price you pay to call Jesus Lord, He's worth everything. thought the same thing a long, long time ago. I used to be a part of a, a, a group of friends and guys that for the most part, if you, if you know my story, man, we all did drugs together. We all partied together. And, and I was the first one to lead the way, as it were. We'll just leave it there. I was the first one to lead the way. And I remember when I gave my life to the Lord. I was the first one to lead the way. I used to run with a pretty, pretty, pretty aggressive, large group. I think the shortest one was like 5'10", and he weighed like 320. Let me put it this way. I was more towards the smaller end. My friends were all 6'4", six, 6'6", six, six, and were not afraid to fight. And when I got saved, they looked at me and went, Jesus must be real. Because there's no way you would ever give your life to God. And I would love to tell you that I gave an altar call and all of them got saved right then and there. And there was a great move of the Holy Spirit. And they all got filled with the Spirit and baptized with the Spirit and, you know, shook out on the floor and shaking like bacon and erupted in a prayer language in the whole nine yards. You know what? None of that happened. You know what I did? I left. I left a party where... I was the butt of a few jokes. I didn't defend myself. I was no longer invited. I was no longer popular. Over the last 20 years, don't underestimate what people will put on Facebook. Over the last 20 years, all seven of them have come to know the Lord. I'm telling you, whatever you sacrifice for Jesus, worth it. I know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, when it comes time for us, for me, to shed this earthly tent, I'll be greeted in heaven by people I never had the opportunity to meet. And we poured in, and we sowed, we, we prayed for, we impacted. Because we're a life that was touched, and saved, delivered, and transformed. And because someone saw what you did or what Jesus did in your life, you become the witness and you become the example that by the grace of God, one day they say I want what he has you go I'm just a believer I don't need to give my life to the Lord pastor And well, here's the thing that I would tell you right now you are Jesus with skin on to somebody and as we close this morning 
Let me ask you this question. What Jesus do they see? Do they see the blood of the Lamb? Do they see the word of your testimony? Do they see a believer who loves not their life so much as to shrink from death? Or do they see a weak, pacifist Christian with no power in their life through the blood of Jesus? Have you bow your head and close your eyes? Father, you make all things new. You make all things new. You make all things new. Jesus, you are king. Lord, for every believer that's in this room this morning, if there's a conviction, if your Holy Spirit is telling us right now that, that we are not in right standing in relationship with you, I pray that we respond right now in the name of Jesus. You go, what's my response? My response is this, I repent of whatever that separates me from you, Father. I confess that thing that I've come into agreement with. I renounce that thing right now in the name of Jesus. I disagree with it publicly. I disavow it. It has no power over my life. I refuse to accept that word spoken over me anymore. I turn. I repent. And I receive your forgiveness according to your word. I confess my sin and you are faithful and just to forgive me. And the enemy cannot minister guilt and shame and condemnation to me anymore in the name of Jesus. Every time I hear the enemy's voice and he reminds me of my past, I remind him of his future. You are defeated. You are a defeated foe by the cross of Jesus Christ and his shed blood and you have no authority over me anymore I belong to the king of kings and the lord of lords and he calls me a son and a daughter and I may not be perfect but I stand before him forgiven justified by the shed blood of Jesus Christ because I confess my sin and I receive that forgiveness right now you're a believer and you prayed that prayer from the bottom of your heart you stand before the Lord the Romans 3 would say justified it means he sees us just as if we've never sinned pure and spotless you're here this morning and you've been away for a minute or ten or maybe you just walked away a long time ago and you found yourself here this morning and going, what am I doing here? You know what? I identify with you. I totally get that one. Let me pray with you. It's very simple. Luke chapter 15. The story of the prodigal son. Dad stands at the end of the driveway, searching on the horizon 
for your silhouette to come home. And he waits with a shoe and a ring and a robe to be placed on you. You're here this morning, and I'm going to make it as simple as possible. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And you go, Pastor, that's me. If you would just slip up something ever so slightly, just allow me to see it for just a second. You say, I want to come home. you're watching online and that's you private message 970's Facebook page Pastor Steve is waiting to respond and pray with you I'm going to pray and in that prayer I'm going to bless and dismiss Father, with every head bowed and with every eye closed, you know every heart, you know every mind, feeling, action, behavior, association, and circumstance. You know where our stubborn pride would prevent us from ever admitting we need you. And that's exactly what we do here this morning. Jesus, we need you. I want to come home. I want to be your son and I want to be your daughter. And I, I want to know that when you return, when you come for the church, my eternity is with you. Father, I pray right now for every heart that echoed something like that in response. Seal it upon them by your Holy Spirit. As we dismiss this morning, we thank you and we praise you for the ministry of the hub and what you're doing and we bless what you're doing that we might make it our soul doing thank you for preparing and making a way Lord for that ministry to happen you're not done we simply look forward to the next step Father give us the strength and the courage to be obedient and to follow you. And that's what we bless over this congregation, those that are here and are joining us online. We bless right now with the strength to be obedient to what you're telling us to do, to respond to conviction that you're putting in our heart and our life. And Lord, to follow you, abandon everything else, focus our eyes on you and follow you 100%, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in Clifton, Thank you for what you're doing across the churches and the pastors in this valley. We bless them in the mighty and precious name of Jesus, we pray. And your people said, amen. Man, we love you. We bless you right now in the name of Jesus. Go out, enjoy time with your families. We want to remind everybody that we've got a Wednesday night service. We are doing the Holy Spirit, so if you want to know more about that, come on Wednesday nights. We've got full nursery and kids and student ministries available. We love you. You're dismissed. We'll see you later.